Hello, I'm Don Becker, and it's my special honor to introduce my colleague, Paul Black. I first met Paul in 2008 when he was recruited to the University of Nebraska Lincoln to serve as our new department head of biochemistry. He served our department for 12 years, providing outstanding leadership in research and education. Paul began his career in science by first earning a bachelor's degree in zoology from Colorado State University. And then he went on to receive a PhD in cell and molecular uh, biology at the University of Vermont. He also then did a postdoc at the University of California, Irvine, and then took his first faculty position at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. There he was promoted to associate professor, but then later moved to Albany Medical College in New York and was promoted to a full professor there. Uh, Paul was named as a Char Charles Bessie Professor of Biochemistry here at Nebraska and served as a biochemistry department head from 2008 to 2020. Paul is internationally recognized for his research program on fatty acid metabolism, namely fatty acid synthesis and fatty acid transport. Some of his highly recognized research accomplishments include characterization of the fatty acyl-CoA synthase and the fatty acid transport uh, family of proteins. His group demonstrated that the human fat P2 protein specifically transports omega-3 um, fatty acids. Uh, while at Nebraska, Paul applied his expertise in fatty acid metabolism to exploring algae as a potential source of lipid fuel production. For his outstanding research contributions, Paul was named as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2018. Over the span of his career, Paul has shown a strong commitment to biochemistry education and graduate student training. He has been recognized for his outstanding contributions to education at each institution that he has served at. One of Paul's long-term objectives upon arriving at Nebraska was to strengthen and advance biochemistry undergraduate education here, and also build a graduate training program that strategically linked the life science departments on the campus. As department head, Paul catalyzed a number of significant improvements to the undergraduate curriculum at UNL. He built a, a creative climate of innovative teaching and curriculum development that positioned the department to earn accreditation from ASBMB. Uh, the graduate program in biochemistry was also flourished under his leadership and included, including a new predoctoral uh, graduate program that was started under his leadership. Paul's contributions to education were recognized at the national level when he was named as an education fellow for ASBMB in 2016. Paul is highly committed to inclusive excellence, which was recognized by UNL when he received the Chancellor's Award for Advancing the Status of Women, which commends individuals for their dedication to increasing diversity in STEM in, at the University of Nebraska. These awards demonstrate Paul's drive to enhance and improve biochemistry education and graduate training. Finally, in 2019, the Biochemistry Department received the University-Wide Departmental Teaching Award from the President of the University of Nebraska System. This award is the highest honor for departmental excellence in the teaching at the University of Nebraska, and this award was certainly a great culmination of Paul's leadership as department head here. So now please join me in congratulating Paul Black on receiving the 2020 award for exemplary contributions to education from ASBMB. Congratulations, Paul, and we look forward to your lecture entitled, A Revolution in Biochemistry Education Informed by Basic Research to Meet the Demands of 21st Century Career Paths. Good morning. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, to receive this uh, really wonderful award from the American Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Uh, indeed, uh, it's a combination of research and teaching uh, in biochemistry and molecular biology that has really uh, underpinned my career over the past 35 years. And, uh, you know, out of that, you learn a lot. You learn a lot about, uh, you know, what is going on at the cutting edge of biochemistry. And moreover, you learn how to merge that information into education. And it's really that central merger between these two areas that guides us in developing biochemistry and molecular biology programs to meet these 21st century career paths of our students. So today I'm going to uh, 
basically separate my talk into a number of different areas, and I'm not going to go through each one of them here uh, because they're pretty much self-explanatory. But at the same time, a couple of things that I want to make sure that uh, everybody understands here uh, as I move through the talk. First and foremost is I come at this from either being at a medical school for 25 years or at an R1 institution uh, for, for 12 years. And so that's a bit different than being at a college or university that is largely focused on education and then has a less intensive research program. Those are nonetheless extraordinarily important in guiding our young men and women in career paths in biochemistry and molecular biology. And what I'm going to talk about here today is applicable to them as it is applicable to anyone and any program in an R1 university. So uh, keep in mind that it's really this, this linkage between what goes on in research and what goes on in teaching that really guides programs. And in R1, we've got research that's all over the place, but maybe in a college, you've got a smaller program, but you've also got access to a lot of, uh, of, of cutting edge articles and that sort of thing. The last thing I want to mention as I begin here is this idea of inclusive excellence. Because inclusive excellence is really what has guided me for a number of years in, in building not only my research program, but also building my teaching programs. We start out with a foundation here. All of us, every one of us in this room was inquisitive as a young child. I'm absolutely sure whether it was working with grandma, grandpa, you know, in the garden, or whether it was, uh, you know, hanging out with a hamster or a rabbit and understanding the differences between a rabbit being nice and furry and perhaps a worm being all kind of slimy and wiggly. Those are the kind of things that, that got us interested. And what, what were we? Maybe two years old, maybe three years old, maybe four years old. But it was this kind of experiential uh, things that went on in our lives as, 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 uh, as youngsters that really stimulated our ability and our, our desire to go on in science. Uh, my two older kids loved the very hungry caterpillar. It goes out and it eats and it eats and it eats and it grows. And it undergoes metamor uh, eventually undergoes metamorphosis and becomes a butterfly. Well, why is that? Why is that? We were all curious as to why that was the case. You know, as little kids, how does a, 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 a caterpillar turn into a butterfly? Not that we were thinking about biochemistry then, not that we were thinking about the signaling and all those sorts of cool things that go on in terms of a hormonal context, but we were very much stimulated to guide our, our, our interests very early on. When my youngest daughter was four, I had the opportunity of going to her school and, and teaching them about tools of science. And the tool I used was purple cabbage. So what you do is you take cabbage, you boil it, you filter it, you've got now purple juice, purple cabbage juice. And I took into the classroom a whole bunch of test tubes. Some of them had seven up in them, other had sodium bicarbonate in them. So I had pH that was either acidic or I had pHs that were basic. And I had pretty much everything in, the, in between. And I told those kids that you could take a drop of purple cabbage juice and you could put it into these test tubes. And because the purple cabbage juice was your tool, it would turn things color based on some kind of an unknown within that too. And sure enough, you get yellow, you get red, you get blue. And so the idea of using tools to guide science was really something that I was trying to get to them. Normally you look at, you know, seven or eight test tubes that are all clear liquid, and you go, yeah, they're the same, but then you use your tool. And it is that tool that now distinguishes our ability to, to, to say, well, this is a high pH or this is a low pH. And that gave these kids a clear indication that that's kind of the basis of what scientists do. A little bit later on, you get into middle school, you get into high school, and your inquisitiveness goes even further. Uh, you know, we've got lots of cells. How do they all work? What do they do? Why, why is a muscle cell different than a nerve cell? Uh, you get into cell wars, for example, and with COVID-19, I mean, that becomes a really big thing. How does the immune response work? What is a pathogen? What is a virus? What is a bacterial infection? And these are the things that really guided my two older kids when they were in, in, in middle and uh, early high school. And then finally, we have DNA is here to stay. Foundations of genetics. 
foundations of genetics to, to understand that we are actually more alike than we are disalike. And, and giving the idea of how genetic material is, is transmitted from one generation to another to understand how genetic material is actually read to guide how the cells work in cells or us or how the cells work in, in cell wars. But you get to high school and you know, it kind of gets quiet. Sometimes you've got a great teacher in there. It gets you really excited, but you still have this desire to become a scientist. And you get to college and you go, my gosh, I, there's just so much. There's just so much. And so I'm going to talk about this as a biochemist. So on the left, we've got biochemistry. We all have to understand the principles of biochemistry. But underpinning biochemistry and molecular biology, we've got to have other things. We've got to have some organic chemistry, some calculus, some immunology, some biology. But even underpinning that, because now we're in college, we have the opportunity to build breadth in what we do. And so I tell my students, well, why don't you take a class in art history? Or why don't you take a class in political science or psychology? Why don't you go back and understand tonal theory? At the under, other end of the equation, we've got life. Boy, you're in college, you want to do cool things. Well, cool things may be going to the theater or it might be practicing uh, your violin or playing the piano. It might be whitewater rafting. Stuck in the middle is these experiential programs that guide who we are as biochemists and molecular biologists. I mean, that's, that's where all of this comes. And it's this experiential program, whether you're a Beckman scholar as shown on the top, whether you're in a research lab as shown on the bottom, and these are students working with a postdoc, or whether you're in the middle actually in a, in a teaching lab, that's what actually brings all of these things in science together. So in setting this stage, uh, you've got this foundations that we all have to do. And at the other end, you've got all of the journals in cell and molecular biology. I'm not going to go through them. You can recognize all of them in there. And it really is this balance between what is going on in the basic stuff and what is actually published in the literature and how the stuff that is published in the literature eventually makes its way back to a, to a textbook is really what founds the, this whole idea of generation of new knowledge and, and advancing the discipline. Integrated in all of this, is what's shown in the middle, middle, and it's the experiential programs that we have in science. In the upper left, we've got a professor working with a group of students in a teaching lab. In the middle upper, we've got a, a mentor working with students in her research lab, as is the case in the lower left. We've got students doing x-ray crystallography. We've got students doing high throughput screens. We've got students doing, doing mechanistic enzymology. All of these things now become part of this experiential program. Central to all of this are the mentors. And in this case, we've got three mentors in there. They understand their students. They know their students are, are, are professionals in, in training. They know their students are individuals and they all have to be dealt with or, or taught in a manner that allows them to really progress their program of study independently to become professionals in the discipline. So how do we get there? We have to establish a scholarly environment. I'm very proud at the University of Nebraska. This is what we have done over the past 12, 13 years. And we are actually honored in 2019 as the university-wide excellence in teaching program at the university for innovations in what we did. So here we are, all of us but two. You know, they were traveling at that point in time. I'm standing in the front, but that doesn't mean anything. I, I stand in the front because I'm the chair of the department, or was, I actually retired last year and, uh, and, and I'm no longer chair. But it's the team of all of these individuals together. It's the team of all these individuals together that really made these programs thrive at the University of Nebraska. So, so I'm extraordinarily proud of this group of people because they are really the leaders, the movers and the shakers, the mentors, the teachers, the researchers that really have made a difference in how we move forward. So in this scholarly environment, there are a number of things that are extraordinarily important. And I'm gonna go through these in a little bit of detail. Uh, first of all, is this idea of, of uncompromising excellence. What do I mean by that? It means that whether you're at the bench or whether you're in the classroom or whether you're mentoring a student, 
you have to do your very best. And, and in doing your very best, that demonstrates to the student that you are very much, uh, you are very much uh, advancing their own career paths. At the same time, you really want to have these ideas of research and creative works, and that's what's really pushing the frontiers of science and advancing society. And those creative works can come in a laboratory, they can come in a, in a setting that, uh, that would ne not necessarily be a, a, a primary research, but it might be something that is learned from the literature and integrating the ideas together. Creative work is the foundation of who we are. I mean, humans are creative and you've got to bring that into teaching and learning. We have to teach our students to be lifelong learners. It's not just a four-year program. It's what you do in that four-year program is setting the stage. And finally, what we do in an academic environment has to be informed by the outside world. It's not just academics, but rather it includes business, civic communities and the like, because we have to understand what their needs are and what those professions now have to have in terms of moving their programs forward. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, as we're diverse, the beauty of science is, is that, that we come from all over the world. And we have diversity in people, we have diversity in ideas, and the environment that we create in the academic world must indeed reflect diversity of ideas and diversity of people. So this scholarly environment is, is been tough this last year. Shown up on the upper right is, is a group of students in a classroom a couple of years ago. I mean, everybody's in the classroom were learning the basics. Last year it was tough. You know, it's every other seat, every third seat, you know, you're online learning, you're in class learning, it's tough. But nonetheless, you have to take that foundational information, you have to learn to integrate it, and you have to learn to be very critical in terms of the way you approach things, hence scientific discourse. So at one end, we've got research going on. At the other end, we've got these programs of study that are really diving into aspects of of teaching. And that could be anything from the classroom to get the basics to these small groups shown on the upper, on the lower left, or on the lower right, rather. And in those particular groups, you have to ask, here's data. Where did the data come from? What does the data say? Do you agree with what the conclusion was in a paper? You've got to be able to critically look at that. And that's one of the things that we do with our students. We have them write very early on as freshmen. They have to understand where the data come from and how it's interpreted. They have to understand what's the difference between a standard deviation and a standard error of the mean. They have to understand what a power calculation is so you determine the number of replicates. Those now underpin the research. And it's really this marriage, if you will, between teaching and research that really pushes this forward. And it really enriches the scholarly environment that we're, that we're working in. Now, all of this occurs because we're diverse, but we also have to have leadership. And, and yeah, I've been the leader, but I've been only a member of the team as a leader, but the leader is very much like a conductor. A conductor has to conduct an entire orchestra. You know, the strings have to talk to the brass. The brass has to talk to the woodwinds. But in science, we've got people from all over the world. We've got them from different backgrounds, different religious traditions, different social traditions, first generation students. But embedded in all of this is the idea that we can be innovative in the classroom, whether it be utilizing models to show students structure function relationships between proteins and maybe DNA, or whether it's using 3D glasses to look at protein structure, or whether it's actually working in a research laboratory and discovering something new. This goes on even further. And again, this brings back to the idea of a conductor. In the upper left is, a, is, is the Memphis Symphony. And a symphony and the symphonic tradition sounds something that we can recognize. You add a new piece in there, in this case, jazz. It could be rock, it could be rap. But at the end of the day there, you now have a new sound. And it's that new sound that is better than the sum of the parts. And it's very much like it is in, in biochemistry is when you bring new members of a team together and you, uh, you, you embrace this idea of inclusive excellence and you've got good mentoring. What happens is now you have something that is greater and is new and advances knowledge. 
at the University of Nebraska, one of the things I love doing is graduation celebration in May. And uh, I, I get to know all the students, some 40 to 50 graduates every year. And I can highlight what they are doing, what their strengths are. It's building these communities. Our students present their work in local conferences. And then the students that come out of the labs have developed a team themselves that is really lifelong. It's not just what goes on though in the laboratory. It's what goes on outside of biochemistry and molecular biology. The University of Nebraska has a number of different programs where we engage the community. We engage students perhaps for the very first time. For example, Women in Science is a group of, a group of women that come in from all over the Midwest. They're juniors and seniors in high school. They've never been in a research lab and they're engaged. On the lower right, we have young people, and these are now maybe 10-year-olds, that are learning about DNA. And as part of a Husker tailgate party in the department prior to a football game. But it is this kind of thing that we do that really enriches the fabric of who we are as biochemists. And moreover, it engages the community to show that we're not somehow elitist, but we're really trying to get this information back down into their hands so that they can understand the value of what we do as scientists. Then out of all of this comes ASBMB accreditation. I'm on the committee that actually accredits programs nationally. It's been a real honor to be on this program. And, and the beauty of this program is that it was established following a lot of work by a lot of really smart people, professionals in the, in the field, to put together what is expected of a, bio, a biochemistry and molecular biology program really in the 21st century. And it is that which is accredited through the ASBMB. And it allows us to look at program assessment. It allows us to address the concepts that we're, we're putting together. But importantly, it brings in national recognition. And part of that national recognition is that our students get to go to ASBMB meetings. And as the Undergraduate Research Symposium has, has done for a number of years, these students now have a community that is outside the university or outside the college in which they work. So it gives them this, this importance and this idea that they're really a greater group than just what goes on in their local, uh, uh, local program. At the same time, we have students that get honored. And at the University of Nebraska, we've had 33 students since 2016 honored as, as ASBMB honors students. And each of these honor students get these wonderful cords at a graduation celebration again in May. And they wear those at graduation the next day. It signifies their accomplishments in research. It, it demonstrates their scholarly achievements and it demonstrates their outreach activities. And I couldn't be more proud of these young men and women for really taking on such excellence in what they do, and then moving on to career paths that are really gonna make them the leaders and the movers and the shakers. I would be amiss not to talk about the biochemistry club. At, ASB, uh, at, at the University of Nebraska, we're an ASBMB, a student chapter, and they do cool things. Lower left is they have the big red road show. All the freshmen come in, they wanna know about biochemistry. So somebody's gotta tell them. And this is where students get introduced to biochemistry. In the lower right, we've got students that are now in a classroom working with kids on very first experiments. They do fun things, ultimate Frisbee, whatever, uh, it might be soccer, but it's really getting out and doing things as a, as a group. It's that community building, it's bringing in this balance. A really important part of all of this is the outreach and the groundedness that this now brings our students. So they work in soup kitchens or they work in family shelters because they have all of this going for them. It's important for them to give back to the community. And I really, really love this idea that these students do it on their own. They do it out of the generosity of, the, of, of them. They've got good hearts. They want to make the world a better place. And indeed, this brings this really wonderful balance in, in who they are as young men and women training to be the next generation biochemist and molecular biologist. I'm going to talk a little bit about some reflection and perspective. Uh, to me, uh, it's again, it's been my honor over, over 35 years in the academy to be a biochemist. I'm a lipid biochemist by training, but 
this 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 engagement in students has been with me since the very early phases of me being an assistant professor. And, and central to this is we've got to really get our students well prepared for life. And, and we've got to make them independent. We've, we've got to have them uh, working to, to seek knowledge and the skills required for whatever professional path they take. And, and that could be a biochemist, it could be a molecular biologist as a PhD, it could be you know, a physical therapist, it could be a dentist, it could be a physician. All of these related fields are underpinned in, in biochemistry. But in doing all of this, we have to build a home. We have to build a home, an academic home that these students participate in during the course of their four to five years of study. And so in the Beetle Center at the University of Nebraska, which houses the Department of Biochemistry, we have a, a, a DNA molecule in the atrium honoring George Beetle. And that's, you know, a lot of pictures are taken there. We've got a student in the lower left doing a high throughput screen. He developed it on his own. He was independent beautiful work. I'm there in the middle kind of showing a couple of my students some things that we're doing looking at carbon nitrogen balance. In the lower middle, our students have a home because they now have this academic advising area coupled with a student resource center, which is shown in the upper, upper right, which unfortunately this last year because of COVID hasn't been used, but it brings them a home. And then you might have a group of students, you know, getting ready to do the fascination in plants day. So they're now setting up and they're getting ready for the community to come in. It is these sorts of things that now enriches the fabric of us as biochemists. And finally, biochemistry and molecular biology as educators and researchers, it's far greater than the sum of the parts. You can have a leader, but that leader must now work with the entire group of individuals to really build something that is very much like the orchestra. You know, the strings sound one way, the woodwind sound another way, which when you meld all of this together, you've got a beautiful sound that is very distinctive. And what we do as scientists is very much the same way. We can't do it all. And so you've got to have leadership and you've got to have the resolve in members of that team to now move this forward and actually uh, uh, have a program that is, that, is, that is really at that cutting edge. So the esprit de corps in biochemistry at the University of Nebraska is summed up by inclusive excellence, the diversity of who we are, the diversity of the students we train, the diversity of the faculty, the diversity of the communities in which we live. And it could be, for example, me talking to one of my technical staff. It could be students in the lower left learning how to do biochemistry the very first time. It could be a student in the middle generating a new cultivar that is that is resistant to drought. It could be 12 year olds understanding the dynamics of DNA replication and transcription. These are all the enrichments that we do. And it really brings this idea of the fundamental core values of who we are as human beings. And finally, I'll finish up. Uh, again, uh, it's been an honor to me to, uh, to receive this award for exemplary contributions to education. Uh, there's a lot of great people who have gotten this award before me, and, and, and they're just some of the movers and shakers and, and people that I've come to admire. I could not do any of this without having my colleagues, the staff, the students at the University of Nebraska in the Department of Biochemistry. They've enriched me uh, in, in, in my thinking in terms of how we deploy biochemistry and molecular biology education. I've been honored to have some hundred students and postdocs over 35 years from medical students, undergraduates, graduates. It is, it is those individuals that ground me in the laboratory doing what I do. And then finally, I've got colleagues from the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Albany Medical College, because they're the ones that help guide me from assistant professor to associate professor, professor, you know, getting me through tough times as a scientist. Underpinning all of this are my mentors. And they are individuals whose shoulders I stand on proudly. John Erickson, Fort Lewis College, Durango, Colorado, got me excited about biology and chemistry. Anthony Tu at Colorado State University. I'm taking biochemistry and I talked to Dr. Tu and I said, what do I do next? He said, you've got to take PCHEM. You've got to take analytical chem. I was a biology major. I did, I loved it, I thrived. George Happ, 
boy, I couldn't have done it without him. He was my PhD advisor at the University of Vermont. And then finally, Barbara Ham Callow at the University of California, Irvine. She guided me in ways that excited me about the academy and gave me the tools to move on and be successful. So a lot of what I've talked about today uh, was published last year in the Journal of Biological Chemistry. Uh, references are shown here, and it basically summarizes my thinking about this revolution in biochemistry and microbiology education in the 21st century. And finally, uh, I will be at the Q&A at Meet the Expert later today, 145, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. And again, my thanks for everyone to be here today and listening to what I think is a wonderful story.